Okay. Uh, let's call to order this December 13th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. This is a regular Monday meeting, uh, but we have a special purpose tonight, which is to receive comments from potential proposed changes to the zoning bylaws and the river hazard map. Uh, the first thing uh, we need to do is approve the agenda. So if the planning commissioners could take a look at that and give a motion to approve. I move to approve. Okay, a motion from Gabe. Gabe. A second. Second from John. Uh, those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll proceed. Uh, next thing is comments from the chair. So bef uh, before we get going, I'm gonna run through some things. Mike already ran through a few important items. Um, welcome everyone for uh, this night, this hearing for the for comments from the public. This is the second one we've had. We had uh, one two weeks ago. Uh, the uh, structure that we'll have for tonight is we'll open up with Mike, uh, the planning director, Mike Miller, explaining, uh, uh, very briefly summarizing uh, some of the proposed uh, changes um, that were driven from public comment and request. Uh, we are going to follow a memo that Mike prepared for the order of the comments. Back upstairs. Uh, so play together. You're going upstairs. And uh, we'll stop here to remind everyone that you uh, should keep it on mute unless you uh, had raised your hand to, uh, to do a comment. Um, so we'll be following that list, uh, taking the items as they, are, uh, as they come on the list. The, uh, a link to the memo has uh, been placed in the chat for this hearing. So everyone can access it there. So they'll know uh, if, they're, if they're coming for a specific item, they'll know when it comes up uh, sequentially on that list. Uh, there may be time tonight for the planning commission to deliberate, depending on the amount of comments we should receive. That's not our top priority. Um, the top priority is to get all the comments. And if we don't end up deliberating tonight, which I'm not expecting that we will have time, uh, we'll do that at a future meeting. Uh, I, I think it will probably be a January planning commission meeting that we do that. Uh, which everyone's welcome to, of course. Um, when we do deliberate, we're going to be following the current city plan and the regional plan. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what we're going to be doing. We are not going to be responding to uh, specific projects, specific parcels. Uh, this is going to be um, a process that's holistic and takes the entire city into account and, and all of our planning efforts into account. Um, just so everyone's aware of that up front. And for tonight, for your comments, please keep them to two minutes. And uh, we'll be using the raise hand function like we said before. Uh, when we get to each item, people can raise their hands. I'll call on them individually and they'll have their two minutes. Okay, and, and also to repeat, as Mike said, state your full name, uh, just so we have that record. Um, so that the media has that record if they report on it. Uh, and with that, we can move along to the next item on the agenda, which is general business and comments from the public. So if there's anyone here to speak about something other than the items for, for the proposed changes for the zoning bylaws, now would be the time. So this would be anything that's not part of the hearing Use the raise hand function now if you have something. Okay. I'm not seeing any general business comments, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, that means that we're on to the hearing. So I'm going to hand it off to Mike to summarize uh, the proposals. Uh, and then we'll have briefly have any questions from the Planning Commission if they need it. I'm not expecting they will and then we'll go to the public comment. So take it away, Mike.
So uh, really quick, um, you know, technically, uh, so Kirby's opened the public hearing. Just that way, we've got that official kind of part of the this next step here. So I'm just going to run through. I assume everybody has had and reviewed the memo. Um, certainly, if anybody has questions, anyone has not seen the memo or has any specific questions, I'm always available to answer questions about uh, the contents of each one of these. But I'm going to go through really quick of uh, the 10 just for the public, if anyone's viewing this on television uh, or viewing this later and want to understand what's going on. I'm going to give a quick update of what the 10 proposals are and then and then, uh, as Kirby said, we'll get some quick questions from the Planning Commission, if any, and then get to the public comments, which is why we're all here. So the, the first change is a map change for Harrison Ave and Whittier Ave area. And so there's three parcels on Loomis Street and a couple. So Harrison Ave um, past the roundabout on Main Street. Uh, there's a short road that connects over. It's Whittier and you've got Loomis and Harrison kind of connects through those. So it's a small road. Uh, it's part of the College Street North neighborhood. So it was zoned as, as College Street. And uh, we had some proposals that led us to take a look at that street and decided it might be more appropriate that it be zoned residential 3000, which is the same as uh, Loomis Street and a number of the other neighborhoods in that area. So we felt that was more appropriate to get that rezoned um, to res 3000 from its res 6000 designation it is today. Uh, the second change is uh, up on Heaton Street. So it involves two parcels, the Heaton Woods Care Facility and Washington County Mental Health. So there's a proposal uh, at Washington County Mental Health that led us to take a look at the zoning designations there. Um, and the, this, and uh, the decision was that, you know, these two are kind of unique parcels. They're also zoned as the same district as the residential properties in College Street. So they're kind of uh, non-conforming. So we felt they would be more conforming and more consistent if they were zoned residential 3000, which would increase the density in, in that area and allow for some infill uh, potential on the, the Washington County Mental Health and Heaton Woods site, um, keeping in mind that uh, three acres of the Heaton Woods so the heat and field and the heat and woods area, the wooded part, some of it is actually uh, in a conservation easement. So that can't be developed regardless of the uh, zoning change. Uh, I did want to go and point that out. Uh, the next piece uh, is next change is up on Northfield Street. So this is um, a large rural parcel. It actually includes three parcel, uh, actually includes two parcels. Um, and it's shifting them from one from rural, two from mixed use residential over to residential nine. And uh, these would then match the uh, Colonial Drive neighborhoods, which are also zoned residential nine. The, uh, the idea on this one is that the, the large parcel um, I don't know if it's 50 something acres or 60 something acres, but it's a large parcel. It was zoned rural because it did not have access to sewer and water. That was how we defined zoning uh, back in 2018. If you didn't have access to sewer and water, then you are zoned in rural. Uh, the proposal is to extend sewer and water into a portion of this site. And because we follow property lines, the uh, proposal was then to rezone this property as res 9000 and, and it has occurred in other places. Crestview off Terra Street is also a property very similar to this large parcel interior that has been rezoned to residential 9,000 to accommodate growth because it can hook the sewer and water. So uh, I think most of us have, are familiar with this project. This is Washington, uh, this is um, Central Habitat for Humanity um, has kind of spurred this discussion of rezoning this parcel. So we've had a lot of comment on this and we'll um, no doubt have some more. Um, I've written, I've received some written, uh, written comments, which I have forwarded to the planning commission already that was received today um, from some organizations that supported it, some neighbors that have issues and uh, outlined some of their 
concerns and made some recommendations. So those have all been forwarded to the Planning Commission already. Um, certainly we could discuss them and comment on them further later. The fourth change was to reduce the side setbacks in residential nine from 15 feet to 10 feet. So this was just a general change. There is no specific one there. Um, residential 9,000 is one of the most, uh, I'd say ubiquitous zoning districts. It's found on Northfield Street, found up Paris Street, found up, found up Main Street, up Elm Street, up Berlin Street, it's on Gallison Hill, it's uh, Cliff Street. So it's just found all over the place. And so because there are various sizes, um, you, you know, the zoning at 15 feet worked well in some neighborhoods and not for others. So uh, the proposal was to adjust the side setback from 15 feet to 10 feet, because we felt that would be more consistent with our walkable neighborhoods goals. Um, the fifth change is somewhat specific. It involves the rail line out in the Eastern Gateway, Gateway Farm and Factory neighborhood. So uh, think about the other roundabout um, near the old Formula Ford where the Ford dealer is. So if you go out and route to past it, you have Gallison Hill Road. There's the industrial area that's, that's on Gallison Hill Road. That all abuts um, all those properties on both sides, abut on either active or abandoned rail lines. And so there was a proposal because the setback in those areas was 20 feet which is quite big. Most of those buildings are actually at zero lot lines. Um, and so there was a proposal to adjust that to zero. We proposed five feet. Um, and the person who was associated with um, this recommendation, um, we had said, well, if you get a, something from the state that says it's okay uh, to, to have the rail line, um, they, they agreed, they gave some draft language that basically says, if you get an agreement from the rail line in advance, they will let you build to zero lot line. And so we've got very specific language that's written up on that. Um, that's testimony that's already been given um, and we can review that um, also later on if there are questions. The sixth is to uh, add new language for planned unit development. So we added two sections, one for general PUDs and one for footprint PUDs. Won't get into this uh, too much. Um, most communities have general PUDs um, and don't have these specific PUDs. And we actually in 2018 adopted a whole bunch of very specific PUDs that said if you want density bonuses and if you want these special things, then you need to meet higher levels. But most developers that come in want a cluster, don't want any density bonuses. They just want to be able to move development um, away from uh, steep slopes or wetlands and be able to move that development closer to the road so they could go and realize their development potential. Um, and so that's uh, what the general PUDs and the footprint PUDs kind of do and they're just um, basically approaching things slightly different between the two varieties. I can again answer questions on those. Um, the seventh was to remove the required PUD language from new neighborhoods and conservation PUDs. This has been an ongoing debate since they were originally adopted in 2018. If you develop over a certain size that you are required to do one of these PUDs. And those requirements tend to create a lot of problems for developers. So developers are actually avoiding doing projects because of those requirements. Um, so we, we're just recommending removing the requirement. You could still do them if you want the density bonus and you want to meet all those high standards, then great. But uh, if you are just looking to cluster them, we'd rather have you do a planned unit development general PUD than be required to do one of the other ones. Uh, the eighth is removal of residential density requirements from Riverfront and Res 1500 districts. This came from the Planning Commission. We already have these two highest, uh, th this is already the case in our two highest density districts, Urban Center 1, 2, and 3. Um, so the idea is that we would be using our regulating density per se. We would be looking at the um, bulk and massing, the, the form of the buildings and letting the form de decide what happens. And the basis of that is really to, to try to go and allow developers to, to fill that space um, based on really what the market had. So if, if we need more single, fam single unit 
um, in studios, then maybe we develop more more units. Um, maybe the market says we need more two and three bedroom units, in which case you end up with less total units, but you end up with the same number of bedrooms. So um, that's really kind of the basis. Um, I will mention, uh, I could mention it here, I could mention it later, but I'll mention it here up front. Uh, I did end up kind of having a surprise meeting on Monday. Uh, Congress of New Urbanism and AARP asked to have a meeting with me uh, about our existing zoning, and we got into a discussion about the the proposal, this proposal here. Uh, and they had reviewed our zoning, and so their opinion of that was um, they think that the the removing of residential densities is the next thing that we should be looking at doing, and it's the next best thing. Their concern, and this reflects some of the comments we received last meeting, was that our our design standards were not sufficient. Um, to to make that next step possible yet. So I will just pass that along at this point. We can kind of dis discuss and debate that more later, but uh, they were willing to kind of talk about resources that they could maybe provide that we could use to help basically increase our design review standards to make it such that um, that type of proposal would be uh, more successful in the long run. So Mike, to clarify there, uh, they said that our, our design review wasn't sufficient if to, to switch to, to having no density citywide, right? Uh, well, the concern was residential 1500 was only partially in our design review district. And residential 1500 is only partially in our design review district. So within our design review, they felt there was probably, um, you know, they, they, they haven't written anything up. Uh, they're going to give us a written document at some point. Um, apparently, they've been working on this, and they're reviewing a number of communities around the state and around New England, and they happen to pick ours as one of the ones to review. So they were, they're going to write a report for us. I don't know when we'll get it, but that was the comments that they provided uh, generally was that, yeah, this is the next step you guys should be doing, but your design standards um, outside of your design review district are not sufficient to be able to support that next step. Okay, that's that's great info. I'm glad I'm glad you had that conversation. Um, so the ninth, the ninth is really kind of a, a group of a whole bunch of small changes. They're minor technical fixes. These are things that come up from time to time that the zoning administrator will find. So um, we've got a recommendation to split nat nature or recreational parks into two different groups, um, mostly because we've had a couple of, of things like a, a proposal for a dog park. Um, and we don't have a use that dog park fits into because nature or recreational park is really meant to be just hiking trails. So we kind of split it into kind of natural walking trails is one definition and recreational fields is another. So if you wanted to put in a soccer field or a baseball field or, uh, or a dog park, that is gonna have a more likely have a chance of impacting neighbors. Um, than somebody having a hiking trail um, in their backyard. So that's really what that was looking at, is to make sure we had more conditional uses, make sure we addressed it, make sure we had the definitions right. Um, and then the next grade up from that, so we would have kind of these nature, um, natural parks, recreation fields, and recreation facilities. So the third step, recreation facilities, are much larger where you would have, say, for example, um, bleachers, lights, it's more of a facility. Um, just having a, you know, a basketball court with no, no lights, no stands, just, it's just a basketball court for kids to play on, that would be a recreation field. Um, if you're gonna go and build um, you know, a Mountaineers stadium, that's a recreation facility and it really has levels, uh, really has conditional use and everything because the impacts of that the parking, the lights, the noise, um, definitely want to have neighbors have opinions. So that was, you know, kind of minor thing there. Add provisions to discuss accessory setbacks. So again, small things. Um, garages are accessory buildings. They have one setback. Houses have a different setback because they're bigger. They're primary. So primary and accessory have different setbacks. What happens when the garage touches the house? These are things that zoning administrators run into. Well, does it have to meet the primary 
because it's now connected to the primary structure or does it get the accessory structure because it's separate? So these are the type of answers that I'm into. Uh, a bunch of, couple of things on signs. There's a lot of things on signs that need to get fixed. We just cleaned up a couple of them here. A um, couple of things about fences. We always get comments about fences. Uh, this just clarifies stuff about front yard fences. When is something a front yard fence? Um, a typo change, a typo uh, applicability of landscape requirements. Um, uh, and the last one we did receive some comments on last time uh, involved the, the, the shading requirement. Do shading requirements apply to development? Um, and the current rules were that they apply to yards, walls, yards, and roofs. And the DRB and the, um, felt that was a bit too, uh, too broad and wanted it narrowed. And so the discussion was maybe we should just narrow it down to applying just to um, existing and proposed uh, solar facilities. Um, and then number 10 is uh, some river hazard regulations. So that's why this is actually warned as two separate hearings because technically this is a separate regulation. Um, but we had made some interim changes in 2020 that we have to make permanent. So we'll make those permanent. That's one reference that said, here's where to find those changes. So really quick, those are the 10 changes and I'll give it back to Kirby. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, do any of the planning commissioners have any clarifying questions for Mike? Okay, it's looking like none, which means we can open things up for questions and comments from the public. And as we mentioned before, we'll start with the memo item number one. Uh, item number one is the Harrison. Harrison Ave. Harrison Ave change. I, need to, I was reading farther down, I've got to scroll back up. So yes, the, the map change in the Harrison Ave, Whittier Ave area. Uh, so if everyone who has any comments or questions about that, uh, use the raise hand button now for that. Oh, this is also could be referred to as the Washington County Mental Health. No, no, no that's, the same. Nope. That's, the next, that's the next one. Sorry, sorry. Jump the gun. OK, not seeing. Oh. Yeah, no, nope, I'm not seeing any hands for uh, Harrison. So I'm gonna move on to the Washington County Mental Health change. Uh, that would be a, a change for Heaton Woods and Washington County, County Mental Health area to be changed to Res 6. Um, no, okay. change to Res 3. Change from Res Six to Res Three. Okay, uh, uh, Joe, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, um, Joe Castellano over at Saban Street. I just had a quick question. I know that at the last meeting uh, we had Keith in, who was discussing that they were looking for family housing because they definitely, definitely, desperately need family housing, which is one of the reasons why this proposal is being brought up. And I would like to see if they can get some, did you get some clarification on what they meant by family housing? Is the family gonna be living there or I just wasn't quite sure what the ultimate purpose was. So I, I am here folks, okay. Keith Greer from Washington County Mental Health Services. It's good to see everybody. Go ahead, Julie. Keith. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, in regards to the project, we, we're still in the very early exploratory uh, stages. And uh, this really is a focus on affordable housing for members of our uh, community who may need some additional health and uh, like social services assistance, some of which will be handily on site. Uh, units are primarily for individuals. That's our uh, vision at this time. Uh, and then if we go forward to develop the project, we did discuss the possibility of having a few units uh, on site where more than one person or a small family could reside. And to your point, Joe, there is a, a dearth of uh, family housing, affordable family housing in uh, Montpelier. Our hope is that uh, the project uh, will be with in, uh, in collaboration with regional service providers, 
and to assist those to live independently, not just Washington County Mental Health Service clients. Um, and we are, none of this will be possible with a partnership with our housing uh, partners. And as things, as those partnerships uh, coalesce, our hope is that sort of the vision of this project becomes sort of more solidified. I hope that that uh, helps. Uh, just a quick follow-up question, Keith. Yeah. Um, now, do you foresee that the people um, who would be living in these units would basically have tenancy for six months a year? I'm just trying to give a figure out a time frame or what the, what your your parameters are. There are uh, criteria for transitional housing, Joe, and we're not. That's not part of our vision is transitional housing. We're looking to. Uh, it's affordable housing is what we're looking to create. So be, it would be permanent then? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have anything else, Joe? No, that was it. Okay. Uh, Eve? Okay. Um, I have a couple of uh, questions or points. One is the housekeeping on the memorandum. Uh, there's sort of a misrepresentation that's still there about this being employee housing, um, and also that it's, uh, I think on the last, um, yeah, I think that was the key, was the, uh, that it was a request, that was the other thing, that it, it turned out in our last discussion that it wasn't a, an exactly a request, it was sort of a discussion that got made into a, hey, let's do this. So I don't know, I think, I think the memorandum should be a little more clear about, about the, uh, the history of this and what, is, you know, and, and maybe even what what Keith was just saying, because it kind of waters it down or changes changes what it is. And I guess, you know, uh, Eve Mendelssohn and I live here nearby on Fuller Street. And I know Keith had this uh, mention that this is going to keep the vibe of the neighborhood. But, you know, this is like a, maybe a quarter mile street, maybe not even. And 22 townhouses, I think you mentioned at, at that last meeting. But then I saw on the paper it was four houses with 22 units. You know, it's quite a bit to add to an extremely small and almost like a rural neighborhood if you walk and feel the vibe of that neighborhood. So, you know, we do have some concern that this is, a, you know, kind of a massive change for, for a very little section of town. Thank you, that's my comment. Thanks, Eve. Uh, two and three Keith, days. did you have a clarification there or was that, that four houses with 22 units is correct? The number of units of housing, again, we won't know. We're still in the very sort of early stages of it, but we're not anticipating 22 uh, like units of housing with uh, in four like townhouses or anything like that. That's not what we were envisioning. Part of the uh, plan is to look at Heaton as it, again, those of you who live in the neighborhood, Heaton Street as it is, the building. Uh, looking at converting that into housing. So that would be where the bulk of the uh, individual units would be, would be in that building. Does that make sense, Teresa? Uh, oh, so that's a little different than uh, the bridge article. And also what, like you said last week, I, or whenever it was, a couple weeks, it was more about these ha townhouses and matching the vibe and 22 units. I mean, or 20 units, I think I heard that day. But I think we just want real clear clarification about where it's heading because it, again it, ma it matters to those of us in this neighborhood okay thanks just, thanks everyone so i guess just to, to summarize to make sure i'm i'm understanding what in general what this proposal and this is a little bit of a question as much as it is a, a, a recitation is uh, that there's going to be a number of individual um they're going to be doing creating units in the existing building that are going to be for individuals living to live there. Uh, they'll be permanently living there. That is the client housing. Then they will create four units or four ish units. You know, as, as you said, he's working on it in the parking area, which would be more townhouses for families. Potentially again, all of this is very early stages of uh, exploration and, and somebody asked a question about like why are why are we here and how did we come to Montpelier? My recognition is we started Washington County Mental Health Services as many of us do recognize the affordable 
housing challenges we face as a community and we're willing to come to the table to think about ideas of how to uh, ameliorate that not only just for the individuals that we serve but our entire community you know we see it through the individuals we serve but we're painfully aware of it as a as a problem for the rest of our community this would be affordable housing folks we would have to work with uh, our affordable housing providers the state of vermont and it would not be just for Washington County Mental Health Service clients. I want to be really clear about that. That's not our intention is to sort of limit it to Washington County Mental Health Service clients. But we are also uh, aware of and have experience in providing supported housing. That means that we provide supports to individuals who are living independently so they can successfully live in the community. So that's part of sort of what we are and who we've done for quite some time and we're quite good at it. In regards to the design of the, the land or the buildings or whatnot, Again, we are really early on in the stages. And as we were talking about this, we became aware that Montpelier was uh, exploring potential zoning changes. So hence we reached out to uh, this group here and said, hey, what's up? And that's sort of how this conversation started here. Thanks, Keith. And uh, that is correct. We're always looking at um, tinkering with the zoning. I mean, it's, it's a living document. Um, it's, it's not something that's meant to, to stay static. Um, it never is. Uh, and, so that's correct. And to respond to Eva, I also apologize that the memo was was inaccurate, and I haven't updated the memo because uh, it's just been where um, I didn't want to start changing things in the memo midstream. So I do recognize that the memo was inaccurate. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I went over this with my zoning administrator, who was also in the meeting, and and what was written was what we had understood to be the the request and and the reasoning behind the request so um i apologize that it isn't accurate uh as we move forward you know a new memo is going to be drafted based on what comes up and you know we'll go go moving on from there um so there's yeah there's there's really two things about that that i'd like to make everyone perfectly aware of uh one is it's it's great to know if there's a proposal and the details of the proposal and it's for the purposes of having informed public that's great but for the purposes of the planning commission's information we're looking at making a zoning change and we're not keeping one particular project in mind anyway we're just looking at is it appropriate for this neighborhood to be zoned differently in general uh, so in some ways the specific details of a project actually aren't very important to us if, if that makes sense because of the way that we need to look at it um because we need to look bigger than a project because we're like you know i've said it over and over again we're not basing any decisions on a specific project anyway so with that i will call on teresa thanks um so some of my questions have been answered um but i'll just i'll just chime in uh because i can um that that the letter um did misrepresent um, the, the plan that's being proposed. Um, so that concerned me too. I guess I should just go on the record. Um, and I should go on the record and say that I'm, I also live at three Woodrow Avenue and 19 Heaton street. So I own two properties that abut Washington County mental health. Um, and my only other comment, it, some of the information that's been um, shared tonight has been really helpful. Um, and has answered, um, a few of my questions. I have, I have many more, but as it, as the plan rolls out, um, you know, I hope to get them answered. One suggestion that I could make is, you know, I've been a neighbor of Washington County Mental Health and Heaton Woods for 26 years now, very successfully. Um, we've been awesome neighbors. Um, and I really would have appreciated um, just some outreach, some general outreach from Washington County Mental Health um, to just kind of talk this through and as a neighbor, um, as opposed to hearing about it um, you know, through the through the planning commission, which I'm really grateful for, um, and grateful to participate in the process. Um, but it would have been really helpful. I'm really curious to know, and I know Kirby that you just said that the details aren't important to the planning commission, but but of course they certainly are to us. Um, but I'm really curious to know where the four unit um, building is is going to go. I mean, I'm looking out my window and looking at I know the area like I know the back of my hand. So. Um, you know, that kind of information is a detail, but, you know, it's important to the neighbors. Um, and so, again, um, thanks, and we'll be following it carefully and really appreciate the opportunity to chime in. 
Thanks a lot, Teresa. Uh, Peter? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Peter Kalman. Let me just put my, let me put my, my video on, sorry. Uh, Peter Kalman, um, I actually live across town, um, but I wanna make a, 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 just build on on what Kirby said about the more general point. We all know that we have a tremendous need for more housing in Montpelier. We specifically has, have need for affordable housing, both for low-income individuals and for workforce housing. Not uh, low-income, but not able to afford to even live in the town that they work in, teachers, for example. And I think this is the larger issue that we have to think about. And it, it certainly is it, It's gratifying to know that organizations like Habitat for Humanity and Washington County Mental, Mental Health Services are thinking about this as uh, a, 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 about doing this, these kinds of things in Vermont. So that raises uh, two points. One is the one that Teresa just raised. It is very important to uh, engage neighbors in these conversations. We, that, that, that is absolutely true. But it is also true that some of these convers some of these thoughts, like with Washington County Mental Health, are just beginning. So I think we, we shouldn't think that somebody's trying to pull a fast one on us. Um, Habitat for Humanity also hasn't even yet done or is just beginning to do their feasibility study. Again, nobody's trying to pull the wool over us, but it is also true in this conversation, this came up last time, you know, the chicken and egg or cart before the horse argument. Why are you looking for, uh, you know, uh, zoning changes now? Why don't you do it after you've done your feasibility study? No, that you can't do it that way. It's got to be done sort of in tandem. It makes no sense for uh, Habitat for Humanity or Washington County Mental Health Services to spend their time and money, you know, trying to think through these things if there's going to be a block to it because of zoning. And I think that's why it is both, but what Kirby said is true. They're not dealing here with the specifics of these projects, but they are dealing with the general issue of how do we get more housing into, into Montpelier when there are very few open spaces to do it in. So I, I just want everybody to kind of maybe lower the temperature and realize that this is really a great thing to be looking at. And everybody's opinion is, of course, should be welcomed, but don't panic. This is just really uh, one part of the whole story. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, do we have? Do we have? We have. Uh, we have one more here. Uh, I know Joe's already commented, but I want to make sure Tom uh, Thomas Weiss gets his comments first here before um, before Joe gets his second round. Yeah, if folks can uh, take your hands down uh, so that I am aware of who has a new hand up. Good evening. I'm Thomas Weiss, resident of Montpelier on Liberty Street. And these comments build on a sequence starting with 9 Heaton Street, then moved to 10 Heaton Street, then moved to the upper portion of Liberty Street. And Mr. Miller will have a copy of my written comments that go into more detail. It is premature to move 9 Heaton Street into the residential 3000 district. The standard housing density allows nine housing units on this location in addition to the existing facilities. If bonuses for infill are used, there could be 14 units. If the bonus for a cottage cluster is used, there could be 19 units. And this is not taking into account the new information that I learned today that some of the housing units will go into the existing facility. Uh, so there could be more units because a portion of the lot that's allocated to the existing facility could then be allocated to housing. So I request that the Planning Commission reject this proposal. And I suggest that the Planning Commission instead ask the proposer of the amendment to evaluate the feasibility of a project with the units allowed with and without bonus uh, with bonuses under the current zoning. And it is premature also to move 10 Heaton Street into the residential 3000 district. 
The standard housing density allows 52 housing units on this lot in addition to the existing facilities. And I do have numbers as to how I, uh, how I calculated these numbers in the document I'll be giving to Mike in a few minutes. So that 52 housing units is without bonuses for either infill or cottage clusters. And I request that the Planning Commission reject this proposal too. I believe no one has actually proposed or is considering a project to put housing on this lot. And I believe the reason that this came up is to avoid a one parcel enclave of 9 Heaton Street of residential 3000 district within the residential 6000 district. Because there is no need to amend now the zoning at 9 Heaton Street, as I've just explained, there is no reason to further consider an amendment at 10 Heaton. And then last hearing, a suggestion came up, well, why not toss the upper end of Liberty Street into the residential 3000 district? And it's unnecessary to do that, and it would also not comply with the master plan. The master plan calls for protecting the appeal of the neighborhood while accommodating a modest increase in density through compatible infill development and conversion of existing buildings to multi-story unit occupancy. This portion of the street has 37 units on 31 lots. Current zoning will allow 20 more units, probably a modest increase. Residential 3000 will allow a total of 117 units, more than triple is today, definitely far in excess of a modest increase. The appeal of the neighborhood will be reduced by changing to residential 3000. And my written comments provide more information also on the features of the neighborhood that contribute to its appeal. More density is not needed and is not in conformance with the master plan. The master plan has a goal of 50 new units each year over 20 years, a total of 1,000 new units. Existing zoning will allow more than 2,000 new units in the growth center alone. And I do have backup as to how I come up with that as well. So there is no need to change zoning to meet the housing goal. So I request that the Planning Commission reject the suggestion to rezone this portion of Liberty Street. The suggestion to do this was actually made as conditional on a change in zoning at Ten Heaton. And I have already explained why the Commission should not accept that change, and I have also explained how changing the Liberty Street zoning is not needed to meet housing goals and how the change will adversely affect the character of the neighborhood. Each of those reasons is sufficient to reject the change of zoning district here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Uh, do, so, so Joe, did you have something else? Um, let's, try to, let's try to be uh, quick on repeat comments. But go ahead, Joe. I just wanted to have a follow up for Keith. Um, just basically, should the proposal uh, go through, I wanted to find out what sort of your time frame and what the process would be as far as getting approvals. And the other follow up would be um, if this is not approved by the Planning Commission, uh, could you have the similar density or apply for something through the conditional use of, uh, approval process? So in terms of timeline, there is no uh, fixed timeline right now. I can't give you that. I don't know. There's a lot. Like I said, we are in a very early stages exploring, but really. Uh, and then in regards to your second question, I don't know who just spoke, but uh, he just said that it may be possible to do something with existing uh, zoning. You know, to somebody else's point earlier, you know, we, we got engaged in this conversation because we became aware that Mark Healy was looking at um, zoning changes and we wanted to make sure that we were in that conversation early given that we were thinking about uh, a project like this for Heat Street. So there you have it. Okay. Thanks okay, Joe. Thank Thanks you. Keith. Do we have any uh, other questions about this item or comments? Okay. I'm going to move on to the right, chain. All right, oh, Kirby, before oh, you jump into the, the, oh to the third one, um, Sandy Vitsum wanted to have some general comments to put in uh, that kind of cover a number of things. So um, I'll give her the floor here. Okay. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll try to keep this to two minutes. Yeah, uh, please. 
Please try. Uh, yes, but there's no other opportunity to speak to the planning commission. So I'm you can you can send us you can send us written comments, by the way, just if you want to. Send my us neighbors normal. don't hear it. I mean, they, I haven't gotten the written comments tonight that were submitted to you. Right. What's I, that? It's supposed to be about community participation, participatory. Right. So we need we need right. the whole community and not just a few people. So so that, that's why we have to keep it short, unfortunately. So so go ahead. Maybe you could think of a better format. So, Mr. Weiss, I, I think it was a great um, thing to tie into that in general, I, there seems to be a move to to change the ordinance so that we have fewer variances and fewer public discussions and it's kind of a movement of that is not in a great direction um i, I thought his comments were very good in a holistic way um trying to appeal to the spirit of what is the planning commission which i understand is about planning and also part of that would be doing research and encouraging communication in the public so that we come to some kind of consensus about what is best for the future both as landowners uh, or in residents but um, you know for our children with quality of life I just need to point out to you that I happen to speak today with my next door neighbor who also lives on Loomis Street I should say I'm Sandy Vitz tomb at 14 Loomis uh, Diane Macario lives at 16 Loomis she works tonight she only found out about this meeting in the letter right before Thanksgiving and she works so she couldn't be here she wants to tell you that she found the letter from Mike Miller to be incomprehensible. She said she spent a lot of time and tried to figure out the illustrations, which she said were not helpful. Um, she tried to understand the terms. She said they were not defined. She spent many hours and ended up giving up. I, I really don't think this is the precedent you want to set for, for a knowledgeable community and informed community um, her only recourse is to appear at the city council and make a complaint there which I think she's going to try to do but um, th this is this it, it's a very um, non incoherent way of moving forward and I appreciate that you folks are comfortable working on your own um, Kind of without a lot of public participation when we could be useful speaking more than two minutes but the problem with that is you don't seem to be doing your research and you don't seem to be looking at what are the consequences of some of these changes that you're proposing thank you thank you uh do we have anyone else for the third item or before we move on to the third item for the northfield street Okay, so so yeah, we'll proceed to Northfield Street, which is the um, the suggestion that that came from a uh, possible habitat for humanity project. Uh, is anyone here to discuss that? Hi. Um, use the raise hand function. You have someone, Mike? Yeah, we do have somebody. Uh, Thomas wants to comment on this one as well. Okay. And if, if the folks who are using uh, Zoom could uh, go ahead and use your raise hand function so we'll know afterwards. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me back on this second topic and it'll be the last topic I plan to talk on this evening. Um, and my comments this time are similar to my comments that I made on, on the second point. Moving the rural portion of 102 Northfield Street into the residential 9000 district will not comply with the mass, oops, sorry, will not comply with the master plan. The future land use plan shows most of this parcel to be in the rural district. Part of the parcel is already in the residential 9000 district, and that portion has 11 units now. And under its zoning, there could be three more units. The large remaining portion of not quite 54 acres, if I remember correctly, um, may have 26 units under the existing zoning without changes. 
And those units, the way the master plan is set up would preferably be clustered and with conservation easements or transfer of development rights as it's put in there. And with the bonuses, uh, cottage cluster, and I believe also that infill is eligible here if it meets those criteria. An additional 64 units could be added to 102 Northfield in its entirety. So I again request that the Planning Commission reject this proposal. I suggest that the Commission ask the proposer to evaluate the feasibility of a project with the units allowed with and without the bonuses under current zoning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kreitz. Hi, everybody. Um, first off, sorry for yelling at my kids and yelling at the room right when the, I jumped in the meeting. So you guys don't have to go upstairs. Um, but just wanted to come in as a, as a uh, comment on this item. Uh, the biggest thing I think I really appreciate the comments and helping us orient the planning commissions from the city's perspective of not being about one project, not being about this Habitat for Humanity project as proposed, but being about is this the right place for more housing? And I certainly am in support of more housing in Montpelier. Um, I think the thing that me and my family, when we really get into this and think about it, are really concerned about is how a, a rezone on this without any feasibility study, without any conditions attached to it about preservation of open space or park space, really flies in the face of Montpelier's stated goals um, of building an open space walking and bicycling network in all neighborhoods, you know, master plan goal 2B. Um, and I think that's our biggest concern that this project moving forward may or may not be feasible. A Res 9 developer comes forward and builds something that gets more housing, but doesn't achieve the affordable housing goals set forth in this project, doesn't achieve the um, open space preservation goals stated. And so I just hope that the city can hold on to their bargaining chip of a, a rezone on this parcel or do some other method to preserve equity and open space access while you know the other side of town is getting expanded hover park access this side of town just has private lots that we scurry through so that's my hope that, that the planning commission can really consider how to preserve the equity and open space access through this process this uh this may not be um this may catch people off guard, so so I understand if you if you're not able to to respond right now. But I anticipate that we may discuss making some changes in this area that just encourage uh, PUDs in general, uh, because I, I I expect that we'll, we will really acknowledge this open space issue and uh, look at a maybe a zoning change that involves like a required open or if it's if it's going to be you know larger development. Um, how how do you think the neighbors would react if we did something like that? Uh, devils in the details. Are you asking me? <laughs> you asking my yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because, yeah, just because yeah, you were here last time, and maybe I thought you were fucking. So uh, What's that? I I think that's a good it's a good concept, right? Devils in the details with any of those things. Um, but I think I do think that the most important thing is um just preserving public access while still allowing montpelier to grow and you know achieve the housing goals because those are important you know and it's it's the balancing act and i think the thing that we look at it as proposed like there's a feasibility study not done yet let's rezone now see what happens later the concern is that with the rezone now then all of a sudden you don't have anything to sort of push for a pud or any give from the developer if the whole thing's Res 9, and it's not Habitat for Humanity doing it. Okay, yeah. So they, I gave you a heads up about, about something that maybe I, I plan to bring up for, for the deliberations on this is making, making, making sure that the open space is taken care of, maybe by, by encouraging PUD somehow or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, Brian next. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm on the Montpelier Housing Task Force. I'm a resident of Montpelier. I'm on the Good Samaritan Haven Board. I am an advocate for affordable housing, but at the same time, we have a housing crisis in this state, in this country. I want to just basically put it out there that I think that NIMBYism will really cause a problem here 
it has caused a problem here. One thing that I would uh, encourage the commissioners to do is to really identify what the priorities of the city are. Is, is our priority housing on solving or at least helping alleviate some of the housing problems that we have in the state? Or are we going to basically bicker over backyard, not my backyard? I, I really do encourage the commissioners to, to really take a stand, make it a priority that we want to make changes to try to solve a major housing crisis that is going on countrywide. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Neil? Hi there. Um, I'm an uh, architect. I'm working for Habitat for Humanity um, and uh, we're concerned with this uh, large parcel. There's a piece of the parcel that's on Northfield uh, Road um, that uh, we would like to go ahead and build the house on. Um, the problem with the site is that it's up against the hillside um, and uh, because of that and the zone that it's in, um, it requires that the building be 24 feet high. And because of the way the height is measured, um, uh, it, the building would be built into the grade of that steep slope. So the uh, the average height of the building, uh, at least at the, well, the height of the building at the front, would be over 30 feet. And we can't work that high. Um, but also, uh, it means that that's a three story building um, in, on a very small site. Um, and it, it uh, I don't know if it makes sense for anybody to build there, but you're not uh, given uh, the chance to get a waiver uh, on height. And I'm not sure what the rationale on the uh, minimum height is, but uh, for a small building, that minimum height would have to extend around the sides of the building back 20 feet or more. So uh, basically, uh, it's a three, uh, uh, maybe more story building um, on a very, very, very small site. Um, so uh, I don't know how you would go about doing this, but uh, the, the uh, having the ability to get a waiver on height would be uh, a good thing for us, and I would think anybody at this site. Um, and to put it into um, a, a, a residential nine zone uh, uh, is a possibility. Um, I guess there's some concern about spot zoning or something, uh, but. Uh, having the ability to uh, seek a variance for the height and I would be great. Um, a 10% variance is not gonna do a whole lot for us. It would take a 31 foot building down to say a 28 foot high building, which is still a three, foot, three story building. Um, so uh, these are the my main concerns, at least for that particular site, it's the site that we could go ahead and develop on uh, if there was uh, some way to get a variance for that. Okay. Uh, thank you. I could clarify just real quick to go and make sure yeah. the public thank understands you, that there are, there, there has been two projects that have been discussed by Habitat. Um, it's on basically the same parcel <laughs> Um, and if you if you saw the parcel map, you would see that there's the the large parcel that kind of wraps around. Then there's a little parcel that's separately owned in the middle. Um, so they actually own both sides, all, all three sides of that parcel. They they were gonna, I think it's it might even already be subdivided. That there's that that little tooth that sticks out ended up being made residential, which requires three story buildings um, or two story buildings. Um, and that actually applied to the next building up as well, which is why we looked at those and said they're non-conforming. They don't make sense to be in mixed use residential. Um, they should probably have been zoned in um, something else. And the question was, what, what should that something else be? Um, and then the other proposal was to take that second, I guess, more southerly where the driveway comes in attaches to the big parcel and that's where there's the second project which is the one most of you 
uh, have commented on. So um, that's the larger potential 50 unit project um, that has been discussed. So this, this proposal that um, uh, Neil Husher was, was discussing is just that small piece right on Northfield Street. It's currently vacant, it's just trees, but they can't meet their requirement there. So that's where this, this second piece came in, just so there's a little bit of clarification of why there's two projects, one parcel. Um, this one was just a single, single unit piece that's right there. Um, so that's okay, it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn? Hi, I'm Carolyn Ridpath, and I'm a resident of Montpelier. I'm on the homelessness task force, and on the house, I go to the housing task force meetings. And I want to go back to what Brian said, which is that we do have a crisis in housing at all levels, uh, particularly the, the unhoused and the uh, lower income, but also affordable for people who work here. And I think what the committee has to do is to hold that thought that housing is important. And I think that that needs to be conveyed to people like the housing committee who are doing their best to try to figure out different ways of expanding the housing stock in, in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, do we have any more questions on this topic or comments? Uh, you know, let me try to raise my hand here. Kirby, sorry, John Campbell, I think I finally figured out how to raise my hand here. <laughs> After you started talking, but that's okay. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Kirby. Uh, John Campbell, Three Pleasant Street. And uh, just a couple things I'd like to, to, uh, to bring up. Uh, first of all, I think that everybody on this call, all the people in, in, um, uh, that are concerned about these issues are concerned about affordable housing. But you also have to look to see if we have the resources to actually handle all of the housing and whether or not there are other areas that that um, should be or would be more proper for the housing. Um, you know, we look at up here in this this 56 acre property and um, I look at the characteristics of the land. Uh, it, it is an absolute uh, it's a very steep area, but it's it houses or, or I should say it's a habitat for uh, deer for, for all kinds of birds, for bear, um, uh, and unusual. It's not really like the um, the neighborhood down down the street. Uh, it, it's unlike it. In fact, um, actually, the road to get up here is extremely steep, extremely narrow, um, and we only have probably about 15 or so, 20 houses up here because it is so difficult uh, to to get up here. Um, and then we look at the you know what is the the, the public benefit. Um, here and sure you have to you know take it and, and to find out um, if we are adversely affecting a change to this land or really no total uh, public benefit. Um, you know what concerned me is in talking to Habitat for Humanity when Zach was talking, um, they are only planning, and I don't know if this has come out, if he's talked to you all about it, but you know they're planning on developing about 50 or taking about 51% of the development that they're asking for or that they eventually will do. And the other part will be going to, uh, as he said on the, on the call, um, to the highest bidder. So that tells me that you can get a private developer who can go pick, come up here and build whatever. Um, and it certainly would not be um, possibly very not would not be uh, affordable housing uh, or low income housing. Uh, I doubt that a private developer is looking to, to do that. Um, so I think you have to look at that. And then um, also the fact that, uh, you know, what we have here is one, again, this is on the other side. This is one of the only areas that are really a green spot or green space. And I'm not talking about just for people to walk through or to ride their bike through, but I, I do talk, I, I do, I am concerned again about, you know, the, the habitat, the wildlife habitat that we have back here. Um, if there are other places, uh, as be, has been alluded to earlier, that are uh, better for for housing, or that can that we can do the housing, those are the ones that I think the the city should be looking at, uh, not for uh, taking what green space we do have and what uh, wildlife habitat we do have, and then putting it into uh, a residential area when it could be done in a better area. 
This is not a, a, a NIMBY issue. This is an issue where you have to look at the overall plan of, of the city and what do you really want uh, for everyone. And I think that all the people here also are concerned about uh, habitat. I mean, one of the reasons for living in Vermont is, is because we are uh, so in touch with, with uh, uh, our concern and uh, for wildlife habitat. So I would urge the, um, the, uh, the board to uh, not uh, approve this zoning change. Uh, I think that the one spot down there with the waiver that Mr. Uh, uh, Husker, Husher was uh, talking about, that's understandable. But as far as the back lot area and the back 56 acres, I think that there's no definite plan as to what they're planning on doing, except for that they are going to be using private developers as partners to pay for the project. And that could, I don't think that is a something that is uh, you are currently um, considering. So um, I would urge you not to approve. Thank you. Thanks, John. Do we have any other comments for this item? Yeah, we do have Zachariah here who wanted to respond to those comments. Okay. Brian Watson. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Kirby and the commission. Um, my name is Zachariah Watson, and I'm the executive director. I spoke last meeting, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you all again. Uh, just wanted, there was a recent update that I wanted to let folks know about, and we can say it officially now that we've received the letter of confirmation, but um, the planning grant that we received for this project was approved, um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, that grant will be used for the feasibility of this project and um, a big part of, you know, the the application um, was was the zoning here, um, which will enable us to build uh, as many affordable housing uh, projects as possible. So um, that's really exciting. I just also want to, you know, I appreciate um, any any opportunity to work with the folks uh, along Prospect Street and Colonial and Pleasant Street to make sure that we continue to maintain open space. And as I've said in the past, and uh, we'll continue to say that if we move forward with this project, um, we will actually be protecting that land and turning it into a publicly accessible park with main chain trails that are accessible to all folks in Montpelier. Currently, that parcel is only available to the abutters. Um, they're the ones that walk it. So if folks are concerned about equity, I think it's important to remember that if we really want to create a green space on that side of the river, the way that we do that is we actually create a park, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so, uh, in any way, in any case, uh, we do want to work to find a solution. Maybe some conditions. Um, you know, Kirby, I'm interested to hear your proposals. What you, what you might have in mind. I also would um, like to work with you. Also, our hands are not tied. Um, where this project no longer becomes feasible because of restrictions that were put on it. But we're happy to work with you all uh, to, you know, to again, to make sure that the green space is protected. Um, finally, uh, I do want to address John's, uh, John's comments. Um, John was at a meeting that we had. It was a, publicly, it was a public meeting. Uh, John brought up the comment that he just made, and I directly addressed it. So I think there was some interpret intentional misrepresentation of my comments the due to the federal grants that we will be receiving fifth at least 51 percent of the units that we developed will have to be for affordable housing we will certainly partner with developers that will help us build middle income housing such as downstreet housing and community development um, but the goal is not to sell 50 or 49 percent of the lots to the highest bidder and john knows that and i've known john for a long time but i would appreciate if there wasn't misrepresentations of the things that i had said um, our goal is to build affordable housing and we will do everything we possibly can to make that happen any efforts to delay the process or um, create legal arguments against it will only increase the cost of our project and make it so we will have to um, uh, basically subsidize the cost of the affordable housing with the sale of market value housing. So that's uh, that's all my comments. Again, Kirby and the commission, thank you so much for having us here and for the opportunity to present on this project. Thank you, Zechariah. Uh, do we have any other 
comments for this item? Um, before we proceed, I'd like to circle back to the first item, the, uh, the Harrison Ave Whittier Street one, because we have someone who missed out on that one. Uh, it looks like we just got a new hand though from Peter. Uh, I'm assuming this is going to be about North, Northfield Street, Peter? Yes. Okay, go for it. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to, first of all, I'm, I'm very strongly in favor of the uh, rezoning of the large parcel um, for that where Habitat is looking to build, um, not just because of Habitat, but certainly for that reason, uh, uh, very strongly, but also for the reason that even though I live across the street, I don't really have access to that area. It is right now just pretty much for the abutters and their friends. And I think it's very important that we not mix up discussions about equity, discussions about how there's land other places, and not really be honest with ourselves. That is what NIMBY means, not in my backyard, in somebody else's backyard. And talking about habitat for bears and so on and so forth, you know, I have habitat for bears in my backyard because it belongs to National Life. And I am very glad that National Life is keeping it that way. And this is a kind of protection that Habitat would provide. And if, there, if Habitat is going to partner with some developers to, de to develop some middle income housing or even maybe one mansion, you know, that is going to only be so they can pay for the, the other housing and they will have strict controls over it. And by the way, one more point. All of this, the, the, these theoretical numbers that get so big uh, that, 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 you know, and scary, those are based exclusively on density arguments. There are many other reasons why you can't build 112 units just because you can cut it up and meet the density requirements and all the bonuses. That is very, very misleading. And I think, and, and constant reference to the master plan what master plan is this? Is this a master plan from today or from five years ago? Our needs today for affordable housing, for workforce housing are extreme. And we should not be talking about the master plan as if this is some holy grail. It is not. What we really need to look at right now is getting housing built as best we can with the participation of neighbors, yes with the participation of neighbors doesn't mean with the with, with, with attitudes that are very thinly disguised nibbyism. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, uh, Neil, is this a new hand? Did you have something else? Um, no. Let's let's make a like repeat comments quick so we can so we can make sure we get through everything. But go go ahead, Neil, if you have something. Uh, yes, uh, basically what I wanted to say was the property could develop as um, uh, all housing, but not affordable and the Habitat's opportunity is to create uh, affordable housing and that's, that's our goal. So um, this property is a, a very valuable property. Um, I would like to see um, a substantial part of that uh, as being affordable. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna circle back now we have, to we have uh, one more one more quick one more in person. Local. Okay. Yeah, it's me. It's it's Sand, Sandy Vitz Tim at Fort Loomis Street again. I just um, I'm a I'm a very big fan of housing, and um, I actually have worked on habitat houses, and I've worked in affordable houses most of my career. I've actually tried to develop two tiny house developments um, in partnership with others in Montpelier and neither group got, neither development got built. Um, but I just need to make sure everybody knows that the housing shortage, which is serious in the United States right now, is due to much larger economic forces than this, the size of available lots in Montpelier. Um, people are buying five or more houses and as investments to force uh, and it forces others to become tenants or homeless. I totally get that. I, I think that the the master plan is a critical 
process, not just a document, but process of community discussion of what to do. And yes, it was last made before this um, shortage, but that, I, I, that may mean that some of our um, really vulnerable landscape, our steep slopes need to be sacrificed, but that should be a public discussion. Thanks. Thank you. And, and one one clarifying thing about the master plan, by the way, is that um, the, the housing chapter is is quite ambitious. Um, so the, the master plan does state that, that housing is a serious need, even though it's a little dated at this point, but just so everyone's aware that we'll be taking into account that the master plan does call for, um, you know, us to do, do serious things about housing. Uh, Okay, so let's circle back to uh, the first question, uh, which was about uh, Harrison Avenue and Whittier Ave Avenue, or, or Whittier Street rather, rezoning. Uh, Mr. Josh Kelly had something. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Keaton. And, and maybe um, Mr. Miller, this is a quick question for you. And I apologize for circling back and being late to this meeting. Um, so thank you for humoring me. Um, I guess, Mr. Miller, if it, could you just tell me quickly what the change would be for Whittier Street and Harrison Ave properties? I mean, in a layman's terms, I apologize for that. So uh, really quick, the they are currently zoned residential 6,000. So the 6,000 number is the square feet for building lots. So, and that's also the density, you get one unit per 6,000. So that zoning is uh, consistent with, and you're in the same neighborhood as College Street much larger houses, much bigger lots. Uh, even though your neighborhood is really adjacent to areas like uh, Loomis Street, um, uh, Ewing Street, uh, even Main Street, that area, uh, which have smaller lots, uh, higher densities. Um, and so the proposal is actually to rezone Harrison Ave to residential 3000, so that would increase the, the zoning density um, decrease the minimum lot size. So currently there are 19 parcels that would change. I believe there were either three or four that are currently non-conforming, which means they're actually less than the 6,000 lot size. So it would make them conforming. Uh, it would increase the densities uh, such that a, a couple parcels would then have the ability to add an additional unit. Um, so currently everybody is allowed to have uh, two units um, everybody's allowed to have a duplex in the city is allowed to have at least a duplex unless you already have a duplex. Um, and this would provide an opportunity for a couple of parcels to that have at least uh, 20,000 acres uh, square feet to be able to to develop a third unit and we we had a proposal from somebody who was living on uh, Harrison Ave who came in and said, you know, he couldn't believe that he wasn't going to be able to put a tiny house. Um, on his property because he had a quarter acre lot and he had the space for it and and um, so we said we would entertain that um, and bring that up to the planning commission and see about the rezoning because other people on Loomis Street could be able to do that or Liberty Street could be able to do that um, so that's I hope hopefully that answers the question yes thank you and and thank you to the planning board and to um, the Montpelier Planning Department for your professionalism and your uh, determination to um, pursue the goal, um, even even amidst um, feedback that, that can be tough. I'll just say um, I did land conservation for seven years in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, and you would uh, and this is sort of towards the comment of green space. I mean, it's absolutely something to look at and to be considered. This is just a more of a general comment. So thank you, Mr. Miller, for talking about Whitt Whittier Street and Harrison Ave, of which I, I live on Whittier Street. I'll just mention that, um, you know, really, if you're really honest about habitat, you've got to be looking at much greater size than little old Montpelier. And I, I think that is pretty well understood by, by folks uh, on this call, but um, on the Zoom meeting. But, you know, habitat is, um, if, you, if you don't allow some, um, increased development in Montpelier is just going to go elsewhere. Um, and it is like unlikely to be as affordable or as walkable or as livable um, in some ways um, as it may need to be. So uh, I, I commend the Planning Commission and the Montpelier uh, Development um, and Planning Division for pursuing this path. And I hope you uh, keep on it. Good luck. Thanks. 
Thank you, Josh. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna move on to the fourth uh, item from Mike's uh, memo, which is the proposal to reduce size setbacks in Res 9 from 15 feet to 10 feet. Uh, maybe not as exciting as some of the other things we've discussed. Does anyone wanna talk about setbacks? Okay, I'm not seeing any new hands. Uh, would proceed. Uh, the fifth item is a change uh, to setbacks again on the property lines uh, for the rail line. So that the rail line setbacks. Any, does anyone have anything on that? Okay. The next change is uh, for the Kirby, it looks like we have somebody. Oh, we do? Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm switching between screens, so I'm not seeing. Uh, oh, Alicia, yes, this is this is about the rail lines, right? Yes, it is. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't need to reiterate anything from last meeting, that it's all part of record and whatnot. It'll, it'll all come into your discussion. Perfect. Thank you. That's all. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, I, th I think we feel like we, we know the details there. And what most importantly, Mike is very well informed on in the details. So he will remind us when the time comes. Uh, so I'm gonna move along. Uh, so the, the, the PUD rules, uh, it's not something we've gone into great details uh, at, at the hearings and, and Mike's summary, he, he just referred to the, the written ones. I do wanna take a moment just to tell the planning commissioners to make sure to read the documents that are attached to Mike's um, that, that are attached to the memo um, so that when we go to deliberate, we're all caught up on, on specifically what's said in those documents because uh, that's just gonna take some sitting down and, and, and with it and, and learning it. Uh, and I think that'll help us when we go to deliberate on the, on the PUD changes. Does, in, does anyone have any comments on those though? Okay. Uh, so that's six and seven have to do with PUD language uh, and the eighth item is the removal of residential density requirements from Riverfront and Res 1500. Uh, do we have any comments about that? Thank you. We have, yeah. yeah, okay, we have a couple here. So go ahead, Barb. And you can let others go first if you want, Kirby. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, taking this on. And, you know, it's it's always a challenge to do these public hearings. So, so I'm really glad you're doing it. Um, I just want to make a few comments about this particular one, um, the re, uh, removal of the density requirements, because my sense is that it's just the precursor to a much bigger effort to remove them on more residential districts. Um, so we can sort of look at this as an example. Um, I just want to sort of start out reiterating that I'm an architect, so I've actually used zoning ordinances in the past, so I know how to approach an uh, ordinance and how to make it work. Um, and I've worked with owners to maximize their development on properties. So that's sort of the way I always have approached any of those kinds of, of changes on density. Um, and I'd also want to second Sandy Vitium's comments about that the biggest barrier to housing is, is not density. It, is, it has much more to do with cost and a number of other issues that we can address in other ways. Um, also, I was on the Planning Commission when the zoning was rewritten and we put a lot of effort into figuring out ways to, to uh, increase density in um, the various districts. And I really pushed for moves to increase housing density um, in existing neighborhoods. Um, and particularly if we're considering what the effect is on our um, neighborhood character. I think that, you know, that we can do both. We can have our neighborhood character, we can still increase our density. Um, and I think that the other piece of that is, um, that I'm very much in favor of development on new parcels where that seems appropriate. Um, I think that 
again, if we come back to this idea of neighborhood character. So what I always like to do when, when these kinds of proposals are being discussed is to do a reality check. So I took a look at an existing property on Loomis Street. Um, and right now under Res 1500, that property could have 10 units on it. Um, with no density limit, it could have 20 units on it. And with no floor area ratio, it could have 30 units on it. And so everybody says, well, but is this reasonable? Is it really possible given our, our other requirements? And I can tell you it is, that it would be possible still to meet all of the other requirements, including setback, massing, and the other elements, um, and still potentially get put 30 units on it. Um, is that appropriate for Loomis Street? So I think that's that's really the concern here. Um, and I know that when the zoning rewrite happened, there were a lot of very emotional comments from people who were concerned that developers might come in with the, the zoning densities and tear down existing houses in order to be able to maximize uh, their development potential on a particular parcel. And we were very clear at that point that there were other constraints, one of which was the density restriction that would keep that from happening. But now I'm not so sure. Now I think it could happen that, you know, if this particular person on Luma Street decided to tell, sell their property, it's very possible somebody could come in and put significantly more units on it. And again, we have to keep asking, is that appropriate to the neighborhood? Um, also, in terms of considering whether residential districts are really not like urban center one, two, and three in terms of massing. So the idea of trying to use form-based form -based codes um, in an urban setting is significantly different than using it in our residential settings. Our residential properties have, some, in some cases, very large lots, in some cases, um, lots that are difficult to develop, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't be developed. So it's, it's not an approach, I guess I would be concerned that it's, it's an approach that is really not appropriate throughout our city. So I'd ask you to take another look at that. And just to be clear, I, I recently stepped down from the Planning Commission because I felt that, you know, this, that sometimes my uh, um, reactions were not in keeping with the way that the Planning Commission was, was moving. And that, that was frankly a concern. So um, thank you. Thanks, Barb. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be having discussions along the lines of what you're talking about. And part of, part of this proposal is about asking the question, does, does having a density cap really affect how our neighborhoods look? And we've heard a lot over the years about people being concerned about density and having worst case scenarios. And as far as I've seen, that's never, ever happened. There's never been any like fear over a density increase leading to some terrible development as far as I know. Because we had a density cap. Because we had but, a density cap. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, in a, in a way, you made the point that we loosened up the density caps and everyone said this is going to ruin the city and then nothing happens. And it's kind of the same thing with this change too, is, is the idea is to get people used to Density does not mean that the neighborhood is gonna, you know, be. Can I? Yeah, I mean, that it, we, we could go on and on, but I mean, that, that I know, is kind but of- I know, but you know, that's, that, that's so it is, because it is the, the other requirements prevented that, but they know, those those barriers, those those yeah. um, guardrails are no longer there. And if we'll, you be, we'll be- we move forward with this. We will be, dis we'll be discussing the details of this in the deliberations. I mean, Mike mentioned earlier that he met with a couple of organizations about this and, We'll be taking their um, what they have to say into account in any kind of change we end up making. So, yeah, there'll be there'll be more deliberations. Uh, uh, Joe, uh, thanks, Kirby. Uh, I have kind of a two-part question. This sort of follows up on what Barb just said, but um, I guess my questions for you and for Mike is first: What do we expect this change to accomplish? Number two is I know that I asked you at the last meeting, any cities within Vermont, if anybody else has implemented something like this that we could look to, and there, you said that there was nobody else. I would want to find out if you know of another city of similar size that has done this and what the results have been. 
And lastly, I think Mike could give some Vermont examples. Yeah, it was Newport's thinking about it, and I think it was um, somewhere down south. I can't remember the other town. Well, I think one thing that was pointed out was that uh, Montpelier ourselves, we do it right now for our urban center one, two, and three. Um, yeah. And, and the, the local ones that do form-based code in, in Vermont are, uh, that I know are Winooski, Newport, I think then the folks that are looking at it, I don't know if they've adopted them or not. Like South Burlington was looking at it. Um, Bristol was looking at it. Uh, yeah. One, th one thing that came from uh, the last discussion on this was, uh, was uh, the idea of a, doing a study to see what I think, I think you mentioned Joe, like, a, is there any kind of study to see the impact? And I think one thing I'm interested in, I think the, the best, the best kind of information we could have on this, I think could come from looking at, well, what happened when our urban center changed from having a density cap to not having a density cap. And so uh, we're gonna be looking into that later uh, and make sure that we are aware of what changed. Um, I have the impression that it didn't impact development that much uh, or at all. And uh, like, but, but, but we'll see, I don't, I don't have that info yet, but Mike's gonna get it for us. And I guess my last question is, I know that you met with a couple of organizations. Should I follow up with both you and Mike via email if you're not at liberty to discuss what ARP was looking for? If you don't want to disclose that right now because it's too early in the process. But I'm kind of concerned, I'm just curious on what, what they were saying about how they were talking more about our development review process not being sufficient to roll out this kind of density um, proposal. That's because it's our development review is not citywide. Was my understanding of what Mike was saying? Okay. Yeah, I mean, this was a a, a a study that Congress for New Urbanism and AARP were doing. They're doing a study looking at zoning regulations throughout Northern New England, or at least at least throughout that much. The people on the the call were from New Hampshire and from Vermont, so uh, they're reviewing zoning regulations. You know, they're. You know, they didn't contact us in advance. They already had done the review to try to make recommendations to communities about what are the steps that they could take to improve their regulations to facilitate um, housing development. And um, you know, most of their comments were were very positive. They they said, you know, we're we're very much ahead of the curve on a lot of our uh, things. So a lot of the stuff that we did in 2018 are a lot of the things that they're recommending to other communities to do. So they were impressed by the fact that we already had gone through and, and updated our regulations to match our neighborhood densities. Um, but then they had a number of recommendations um, and, and they were just talking through recommendations and they, they'll have a, I guess they'll send a, a report when they're done. Um, they just kind of wanted to, they, they do a review, then they talk to the and then they come back um, and and amend and adjust based their their conclusions based on what they hear heard from me and uh, from Meredith, our zoning administrator. So um, I'll be very curious to see. I think what they were looking at is is you know kind of different different stages along a, a, a curve. And you know I explained to them a lot of what came up in the last. You know Joe, you were involved in that last zoning process as well. You know, they, they wanted to know why we only adjusted our zoning to accommodate, you know, kind of match the 90%. They're like, well, you don't give yourself a lot of infill potential. You could, you could, you know, you could take your res sixes and make them res threes. And I said, well, we, we had a public process and we heard from the public and um, the public was very much concerned about um, neighborhood character. And, you know, we made, we matched our zoning to the neighborhoods, which allows some modest um, increases in properties that are underdeveloped. So some properties are fully developed and can't add any more, but some underdeveloped properties could get more units. Um, and that's what the community was supporting. So I'll be interested to see their report. I don't know if that necessarily means we're gonna, we're gonna automatically take up those. Um, I don't know when we'll get that, that report, um, but they're, I know they're working on Montpelier and Burlington so you know, I'll be curious not only to see what our report says, but what some other communities have in their reports. Um, and just kind of, you know, as I said, we're, we're, we're kind of trying to explore things and 
it's good to have a third party take a look at our rules. But again, related specifically to this, their comment was um, removing residential densities is, you know, that's for communities that have gotten to the point and we are there to, to explore that. But their, their, their concern in the conversations was um, if you don't tie it to, to design review standards, um, sufficient design review standards, then you are at risk of um, having bad development. It doesn't mean you doesn't guarantee bad development, but you leave yourself at risk to have somebody come in and abuse the rules. And I think that's what Barb was getting at. And I think that's what the, the, the um, CNU was talking about. Um, getting rid of the, the density is a good idea um, in their view, um, because uh, it, it's an artificial number. And what we really need to be concerned about is, is the bones and making sure that the design review rules, not just bulk and the design review rules that go into that, that there's a sufficient process. Um, and, you know, looking at the details, as, as I think somebody said earlier, the devil's in the details. And a lot of the times that's what we have to watch out for is, you know, we do have good rules on demolition. Are they good enough? So those ideas of, well, somebody could come and tear down this building and put something else up. If it's a historic building, it's, you know, we have rules to protect the teardown of any historic. Are they sufficient? That's a, that's a, a question for everybody to, to consider, planning commission, staff, city council, public, um, to prevent somebody from doing teardowns. Um, but I guess that's where I'll, I'll leave. That's where the conversation, I'm very interested in seeing their report. Um, I talked to them for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, so. And, and, and then thank you, Mike. I, I appreciate you, you uh, clarifying that for me. I, I, I really appreciate that. I guess the other question, it was the first part of my question is, what do we hope that this rollout of the um, form based zoning is will accomplish? I mean, do you guys have some sort of ideas what sort of increase in housing density we might see or any sort of rough number? Uh, the the hope well for one thing I want to I want to say that um, when Mike and I first started talking about this before we ended up putting it as as part of these proposals, I I thought that uh, that 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 the two areas we were consider the two types of neighborhoods we were considering removing the caps for I thought that they were entirely within the um, design review, so it's it's good it's good that that's come to light because that's that wasn't my understanding when we first looked at this. I, I thought that this was going to, so, so that's definitely something that's going to come up in our deliberations and we're going to need to tweak for sure. Uh, the, 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 I, the, the policy goal is related to uh, removing the arbitrary things that uh, could potentially get in the way of new housing. But for me, uh, it's also a factor that uh, Density arguments obfuscate the actual issue, and I think we've we've we see that in hearings like this, that people fixate on zoning when they're really concerned about how something looks, with or they they fixate on the density rather when they're when they're really concerned with the look of something, and so let's have our conversations, let's have our zoning designed in a way in which we can have those conversations, and we don't have. Uh, these proxy arguments that have to do with density that's not actually the issue. Um, like when Barb was saying earlier that there was on Luma Street something could go from 15 to 30 units. I think those of us who are interested in, in increasing housing say that's wonderful. It, she was saying it would look exactly the same but it would have twice as many units. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, <laughs> isn't that what we want? <laughs> isn't that the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, so you can see how density kind of gets in the way of uh, our conversations. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much, Kirby. I appreciate you uh, following up on that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Teresa, you had a comment on this. I just have a, um, a quick question, maybe for Mike, I'm not sure, just for my edification. On six, number six and seven, Mike, on the memorandum, Mm -hmm. um, earlier, earlier in the evening, you talked about um, that developers were, um, I don't know if complaining is the right verb, but uh, they were talking about um, requirements that were burdensome and, and hence the, this creation of number six and seven, so the removal of the required PUD language. Can you talk about what the developers were complaining about or what requirements they 
would like to see removed? In other words, what's what's the basis? Yeah, so um, let me grab one really quick here. So uh, the, like the new neighborhood, so the new neighborhood um, planned unit development. Uh, so it, it's really, it's designed, the principle behind it was that if you're gonna have and get an increased density bonus, then you need to meet certain additional design requirements. And uh, we had developers coming in that were going through and saying, yeah, but I don't need the additional design requirements. And they would end up, um, let's say, having a requirement that in, in new neighborhood that no more than 75% of the dwelling units may be the same. Um, so you're tripped into new neighborhoods by having Oh, let me see what the number is. Uh, 40 units. So let's say you had a large parcel and you were going to do a 40 unit apartment building. That would automatically trip you in. If you're in that zoning district, that would trip you into a new neighborhood. You'd have to do a new neighborhood. And then you would have to go and take that and not be able to do the 40 units. Um, you'd have to at maximum have 75% of those units be a um, multifamily. And you'd have to then go through and start making other um, single family. So we've had projects that that would have to then come in and do 39 units just in order to avoid tripping into the PUD um, sections. But they have rules like no more than 75% of units uh, may be the same type. Um, I think okay. there, and yes, there were issues with um, where, where the direction the buildings were facing um because um we, we eventually took it out of the riverfront district because um you know all the buildings had to face the street um and because the street on in going up through sabin's pasture the new proposed street on sabin's pasture would be asia way that would mean that you're, you're not really facing you're not facing the buildings towards barry street which we would all think is there because there the street there is asia street um, so it was a number of issues like that where they're like, well, we really want to go and kind of present ourselves to to the, the you know, not to this little access driveway. We want to present ourselves to Barry Street. Um, so they had issues in there. So there are a number of little things that 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 just started to catch up with it. And the conservation PUD has all sorts of it sounds good in concept, but when you start talking to to folks who kind of get the, the nitty gritties, you start finding it's really hard. To, to track and administer. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, looks like uh, we've handled that topic. Uh, so next, we still have a number. We still have a number eight. We still have um, Sandy wants to have a comment on number eight. Oh, okay, Riverfront. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate Mike's comments um, that he from the feedback. And um, I want to say, I don't think Barbara and I are afraid of density. I live next door to 10 Loomis, which has at least 15 units. Most of them are studios in it. And um, I get along fine with my neighbors. That's not an issue. And to, to kind of reduce the conversation to that is a, I'm, I'm going to try to explain it better. Um, the, the, I would say the one thing that stands out with that is the very large non-residential parking lot. Um, uh, that I mean, that's a completely separate issue right now. Um, so what Montpelier has, if you look at the R1500 district, is traditional zoning, which is defining maximums, maximum setbacks, or sorry, minimum setbacks, maximum, maximum density of, of footprint of the building, floor area ratio, heights, you know all this. To take away one maximum of density, but leave all the others is not form-based zoning. It's just not. Form-based zoning, where I have worked with it in other cities, is very specific. It, it tells you, for instance, the range of the slope of the roof. Where I live on Loomis Street, most of the houses have pitched roofs. If an architect is to build 
maximum, if they're told by the developer to put the maximum number of units on, it's going to be a much larger building. I did the drawings a few years ago and tried to explain this, and it was difficult to get across. I'm so glad Barbara's doing it now. But I'm going to give you quickly an example of my own property, 14 Loomis Street. It right now has three units. Um, so I, uh, two of them are kind of shared and one's a separate uh, care to, uh, you know, carriage house. And the total income from that is about, including if I were to convert mine as a rental, uh, 4,500, you could say, let's say 5,000 a month. If I were to sell my property, someone could buy it and they would do the math with today's rental rates 20 to 30 units let's say if there were 20 they might get a thousand dollars a month if there were 30 maybe they'd get 700 dollars a month N however you look at it that is twenty thousand dollars a month period and very quickly it makes no sense to keep the existing building it's going to be torn down because it's not half of the r1500 is not in the the historic design review district and almost half of the riverview front district is not there so really honestly i've seen so many buildings get torn down in montpelier it's pretty easy to justify it you let it fall apart and you say oh it's not worth the expense to fix it and if you're putting in 20 units or 30 units each with a little bathroom and a kitchenette very quickly there's no point in trying to restore or you know renovate an historic old house it's just way too much infrastructure so it's easier to tear the thing down and start new i mean the floors aren't flat uh you know there's not good insulation in the walls they're not great mechanical the whole thing just says tear me down and then they once they start that exercise they will any developer will build out the maximum number that they can on the site. That's how the math goes to get the maximum amount of income. And if you were a developer, why would you consider $5,000 a month versus $20,000 a month, right? That's how they paid down their construction loan. So I, I, the max just removing one part of what used to be coherent and keeping the maximums a is not form based, which which is where you're trying to go, and B is just it is opening a Pandora's box. And yes, I agree, the boogeyman has not shown up um, so far. But your your urban center is mostly commercial, it has some. It, it would be hard to build it out a lot further. And commercial, you've probably known, has been depressed, horribly depressed, because everyone's working at home, not shopping. Um, th there's no surprise to me that there hasn't been a big pressure on our our building footprints and massing in the last three years. Uh, two of them have been COVID. So I, I, I just say that it hasn't hit us yet I, is actually not true. If you look at Cedar Street, that one development really disfigured Cedar Street. And I, I hope you've walked down at, at nighttime. Really, all you see as a pedestrian walking down Cedar Street is big concrete piers and fluorescent lights. And it does not feel at all like it used to. So it was disfigured. Um, only one will begin to really turn a neighborhood and actually change what is the norm in that neighborhood very quickly. And I, I am so encouraged that Mike is taking my comment seriously about um the design review district i mean much of my neighborhood has been inventoried by the state it's just sitting there waiting to be made uh part of the historic district and i, I get i bet my neighbors if they knew about this would actually support this and i know a lot of them came out against it before but they didn't know there was i'm afraid we're out of time thank you um i also want to say i whoever mentioned the uh idea of doing some studies to actually see what this would look like. Thank you so much for hearing that too. Okay. Um, do we have, uh, Teresa, I take it your hand, your raised hand is from before. Is that correct? Sorry, sorry about that. It's okay. It's, okay. it's, old. it's uh, an old hand. 
So we have we have the technical fixes next. Does anyone have any comments for any of the technical fixes? Maybe I should have started in reverse this time because if anyone does have comments on this, I, I feel for them because they've had to wait a long time. Anyone have anything on any of the on number nine technical fixes? I do. <laughs> okay, Sandy's got Sandy's got another quick one for I'm number sorry. nine. Am I the only? Yeah, do you want to let other people go first? No, I think you're the only one. Okay, I'm I am truly sorry, but this is all important. Um, so, um, I think this is where you're looking at the part chapter three forty changes. Uh, planning and development that was number six and seven, but we can. Oh, geez, I'm pro. Oh, okay, I just 30, 3402G point D frontage. Is that about footprint parcels or is that about frontage of a lot? Uh, which number? This one. Here, while, while he's doing that. 30. Oh, is that footprint par parcels or lot parcels? Uh, that would be under the footprint one. Okay, good. And now the next one, uh, accessory structures, deck and garage. Is that just PUDs as well? Uh, no, that's actually, this gets to the number nine one that we're at right now. Okay. Oh, good. I'm in the right place. So um, that is a uh, three zero zero two point C B four where an accessory structure such as a deck or garage is attached to a principal structure, um, etc. Uh, when you have reduced the setbacks down to five or zero feet, a deck does not impact the neighbor a garage will and that ties in with the next one of uh, the other one about just uh, reducing um, or getting rid of the language to protect uh, here's, um, uh, neighboring lots from solar devices but nothing else there are a lot of people who um, live including me off of our gardens and um, Traditionally, something like that is done with a variance, which gives the public an opportunity to talk about it, not as an obstructive tool, but rather as a discussion tool to see if something better can be solved. I wish these things were staying as variances so that there could be a discussion um, to to uh, I was talking with Diane today about she was saying, oh, I would love to put in a house in my backyard. That'd be great, but if she were to put it on the lot line, then then it would totally impact the the any per use of my backyard. Um, that I I think it's a mistake to be able to to um, both with view, but mostly with light affect the neighbor's yard. And a deck won't do that, but a garage will, and um, other other structures might too. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other comments about uh, the proposed changes? Does anyone have anything else before we move on on the agenda? Okay. Uh, we don't have time to deliberate, obviously. We're out of time. Uh, okay. And we also don't have time to consider the minutes. So we're gonna skip those things. Uh, so before we adjourn, I'll give one last shot, uh, shot to see if anyone has anything else to comment on regarding these proposals. This, this is the final hearing uh, for comments. Okay. In that case, do any of the planning commissioners uh, want to move to adjourn? Well, officially closed the hearing there, Kirby. The, the hearing is closed. The, the, uh, the hearing shall be closed. Motion to adjourn, Kirby. Okay, we have a motion from Gabe. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Jeff. Those in favor of adjourning? Say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Everybody read up on all the materials and we will deliberate later. See you at the next meeting. Yeah.